verses of John's Gospel, and what I'm going to try to do is hopefully put the cherry on top for you of John 1, 1 through 18, and then uh, after the session tonight, we're going to plow straight ahead to the rest of chapter 1 in John's Gospel. So every week when you get back, what I'm going to be trying to do is share a few thoughts with you about these verses that you've been studying all week and that you've just had a long discussion about uh, in your small group. So I just want to jump in because I have a very limited amount of time. Before I jump into the prologue, the first 18 verses, I just want to say a general note about reading and scripture and something that's going to prove to be very important for us as we go forward because John's Gospel as I said last week, has lots of subtleties, there's lots of layers of meaning. So I want to say something real quick about how we're, how when you're reading it, something you want to keep in mind. Okay? When we read scripture, what we want to look for is two senses of scripture. So the way that I want you to think about this is like you say something and it has a double meaning. Alright? So this is what St. Thomas Aquinas said a long time ago. He says. There's a literal sense of scripture or a plain sense of scripture, sometimes it's referred to. It wants to tell you about something that happened. There's an event that took place, and so there's a narrative, right? Uh, Jesus uh, is going to be baptized in the section that you're going to read about uh, this coming week, right? So you're going to read about the events uh, around that and about John the Baptist, all right? So there's some events that actually took place that the Bible always wants to tell us about. But there's also a whole other thing going on when, the, when John writes his gospel. He, he speaks in double meanings all of the time. And so there's always a spiritual sense to what he's writing as well. So as you're reading along, like, okay, so he's going to uh, Cana. And he's going to go to this wedding at Cana, and a lot of you are familiar with that story. But as he's telling the story, there's a whole other thing going on underneath the narrative. And there's a spiritual meaning, all right? So this is true for all of the Bible's books, but it's really, really especially true for John's Gospel. And so one of the things that I'm excited about as you guys start reading John's Gospel is for you to start seeing that there's a spiritual sense to so much of what he's writing. Now, what do I mean when I say the spiritual sense? First of all, I mean that there's signs and symbolisms all over the place. In fact, one of the things that you guys read in your packet this last week is that John's gospel has seven signs that he doesn't call them miracles. He calls them signs. And signs point to some other reality. So St. John's gospel has its foundation in this concept. This concept that there are symbolic meanings all over the place. All right? The second thing is that there are spiritual lessons for us all over the place. These things tell us how to act. We put ourselves into the scene. Like, think for a minute uh, about a familiar parable. Let's say the parable of the Good Samaritan. All right? The guy gets beaten up. He's lying on the side of the road. You guys have heard this story before. And what happens? The priest, does he help him out? Nope. Right? The good guys don't help him out. It's the lowly, the priest, the Levite go by, and then the Samaritan helps him out. So one of the things we learn about that is we learn a narrative, and we learn a spiritual lesson for us. Right? Are we supposed to help those in need? Absolutely. Right. So one of the things that we know about the Gospels is that as they teach us and as they tell us about what happened in Jesus' life, we're always supposed to be asking ourselves, how can I take this lesson into my own life? All right? So there's symbolic meanings, there's lessons for us, and one of the things that Scripture does frequently, which you'll see John do all the time, is that there's all kinds of future that he envisions, this future pointing towards heaven. Okay? So as you're reading the gospel, read the layer of narrative, but try to lead, try to see some of the symbolism, all right? And that's what we're going to be pointing out to you in all these outlines. A lot of the questions that we're asking are not just about the literal sense, they're about the spiritual sense. What does it mean for you? Hopefully this is a familiar image to most of you. This is the central image in our church over here. 
probably the most frequent question I get asked, like, what are those little creatures around Jesus, and why are they there? All right, a lot of people have asked me that. Uh, and what I'm referring to uh, are these little dudes around here. This is uh, from Revelation 4, verse 7. John sees an image of Christ on his throne, and that there are four living creatures surrounding the throne. The first one's a lion, the second one is, there's a lion, the second one's an ox, the third one's like a man, and the fourth one's like a flying eagle. And Christians have thought that these refer to the four gospel writers, okay? They've interpreted these creatures as referring to the four gospel writers. And if you look closely next time you're in church, you'll see there's these little scrolls or books that are in their hands. Well, St. John is traditionally uh, thought of as the eagle. And the eagle is associated with St. John because it soars to heights. So one of the things that you want to keep in mind as you're reading John's Gospel is that there's a lot of theology that's being communicated. This spiritual sense is something that John kind of majors in. He specializes in this spiritual sense. So there's a lot of theological reflection that's happening in John's Gospel. So John is like an eagle taking us to new heights, okay? And so traditionally, uh, that's what, what Christians have thought about John's Gospel, that it's, it's, it's more of a reflection, it's more, uh, it has more symbolism than uh, all of the other Gospels. So one of the things that we're excited about is not just reading about events, which are great. We want to know about the events that happen in Jesus' life. But we want to know also about the meaning of those events. All right? The prologue. This is what you guys read this last week. It's what you've been praying about and reflecting on. Just a few quick things on that. Just like all prologues in everything, uh, John's prologue is kind of a before word. It's an introduction to the major themes of his gospel the major themes of John's gospel are life, life, and the creative word. And you see them all uh, right there in the first five verses of John. So you, he is uh, the light which has come into the world, the light of all people, and the light shines in the darkness. Jesus is, and he'll tell us this later, the light of the world. Uh, Jesus has come to give life, and we talked about that last week, that the point of uh, John's gospel, if you remember, is so that you may believe, and that in believing you may have life in his name. And everybody probably heard that this last week. And then, of course, we have the creative word, that Christ is the word of God, and the beginning was the word, uh, and the word is involved in creation. One of the things that I hope you picked up on are the parallels that John has to the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And this is a familiar story. If you come to church this Sunday, you're going to hear some more about this because it's the reading on Sunday in church. Genesis chapter 1, God creates the heavens and the earth, right? Is, that, is everybody familiar with that? God is the creator of everything. That's what Genesis chapter 1 tells us. Well, what are the major themes of Genesis chapter 1? The same exact themes as John chapter 1. Light, right? Like, so God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. He separate the light from the darkness. The creative word, God speaks. It says, let there be light, and there was light. And God says, let there be whatever, and there is whatever, Right? So that creative word, when God speaks, creation comes into being. That's the second, uh, that's another one of Genesis's uh, themes. And of course, life, God is the giver of all life. So the themes that John picks up on are right here. Life, life, and the creative word. And John tells his story there at the beginning in the prologue so that we'll think about Genesis chapter 1. So the best way I can say this is like there's two dots and he's drawn a line between these two dots. He wants you to think about John 1 the same way you think about
about Genesis 1. <coughs> he wants the major themes of John 1 to be the same themes as Genesis 1. And he's going to keep coming back to these themes throughout his gospel. Uh, and I talked about that a minute ago. Jesus in John 8, 12 says, I am the light of the world. Jesus in John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 11, 25 says, I am the resurrection and the life. And throughout the gospel, we see Jesus speak. We see these healings happening. We see lives being changed. Uh, and we see the world being redeemed. All right, so, so these are the major themes of the gospel of John. And they're all laid out there in the first few verses. And he keeps coming back to those themes uh, throughout his telling of Jesus' life. One of the things that we read in this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, is that Jesus Christ is the creator of all. And he's come into the world to bring about a new creation. All right? And he's present in creation. This is this cool little icon of, like, Christ uh, drawing out the cosmos. He's, he's there from the very beginning. Right? So Jesus is not a, a kind of an afterthought. Jesus is not just what happened, like, you know, around the time of zero A.D., right? Uh, that what we're reading with the first 14 verses of John's Gospel is that Christ is, is present uh, from, all, uh, from, the, from all eternity. And that he was present in creation. And because this parallel between John 1 and Genesis 1 is there, what we're reading is that Christ has come for a new creation. All right? I don't know if everybody's following me. We have a lot of blank stares. That just could be because it's so amazing. <laughs> the word, word. I want to talk just for a minute about this word, word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Excited about John. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, so this word in Greek is logos. All right, and so when we talk about the word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. We're not talking about a spoken word. We're not talking about a written word. We're talking about a, a concept of the Father's perfect self-expression uttered from all eternity. So when the Father speaks, when he utters any word, he always utters Jesus. All right? It's just like in Children's Chapel or now Parents Day Out, when you ask a question, the kids always raise their hand and say, Jesus. And it's always the right answer. <laughs> so the Children's Chapel answer is always Jesus. And when the Father speaks, he always speaks Jesus, right? So when we want to understand what God has to say, when we want to get into the mind of God, when we want to understand something God has done, where we want to look is Jesus. He is the full and perfect revelation of God. So anything, when we, when we use this word, word, what we mean is that you want to know something about God. You want to know something about what God is doing. You want to understand God. You look to the person of Jesus Christ because he is the full revelation of God, the full and perfect revelation of God. This name Logos, uh, and it's not Logos, although I guess you could uh, pronounce it that way if you wanted to, but Logos, uh, uh, it's a common name for Christ in the New Testament. Uh, it's a common name for Christ in the early church. Uh, when they're talking about Jesus, uh, they talk about the Logos, all right? The Word of God, the one who, who reveals God and expresses God to us. Uh, John sees this in Revelation 19. Uh, he is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So when we say the Word of God... Yes, we mean sometimes the Bible, uh, but what John means when he says the Word of God is the person of Jesus Christ in this first chapter, all right? Moving on.
moving on. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, this is a, a little bit tricky because there's two Johns we're talking about here, and I hope nobody got tripped up on this. John the Evangelist is the guy who's writing the story, and John the Baptist is the one he's writing it about. All right, so we want to make sure we get that straight because the next section is about John, and it's about John the Baptist. Two different guys. John the Baptist is not the writer of this book. John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. He's the one who comes to prepare the way for Jesus. He's out in the wilderness preaching, and he's saying, you need to repent from your sins and be baptized for the remission of sins. And there's going to be someone who's coming after me who's a lot cooler than I am, uh, and you've got to get yourself ready for him. And so the very next section that you guys are going to read this week, John 1, 19 through 51, is all about John the Baptist kind of laying the foundation for Jesus, all right? So we got to make sure that we understand that John the Evangelist is not John the Baptist. And then John the Baptist, what we want to understand him as is the bridge between the Old and New Testament. You guys remember... John the Baptist, he has this uh, weird outfit. He's out there yelling at people. He seems kind of cranky. He wears camel hair. He's eating locusts and honey, and he's just kind of cranky out there in the desert. And you'd be cranky, too, if you're eating all that junk. Uh, what's he doing? John the Baptist, the little uh, camel hair and leather girdle, well, when the Bible talks about the prophet Elijah, it says he wore camel hair. A leather girdle. All right. John the Baptist is out there in the wilderness, and what he's doing is he's a prophet. He's a prophet just like the prophet Elijah was. And so he's this bridge figure because he represents the last of the prophets, and he's the first person to recognize Jesus. All right. So he's the last of a tradition, and he's the first of a tradition. John the Baptist is the bridge between the Old and the New Testament. All right? So as you guys start reading this next week about the ministry of John the Baptist, you'll read that his ministry, of course, is not to be the light, but to testify to the light. And you'll start reading about how he goes about that. We are running out of time, but I want to say a few more things. But to all who received him, John writes, who believed in his name, he became, he had power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. So when we speak of God, one of the things that we want to always do so that we don't get off track is we always want to speak of God in relationship terms. We speak of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we believe the three persons of the Trinity are themselves in a relationship, and we speak of God as our Father, and we are His children, all right? So there's lots of ways of understanding God. But one of the things for Christian people that we want to understand primarily, this is where John, he lays it out for us. If you believe in His name and you receive Jesus, then you become children of God. So then ours is a religion of sons and daughters of the living God, that God is our Father, and it's this close family relationship that we have with Him. John picks up on this in his first letter. He says, see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. So it's very helpful when we talk about God to talk about a relationship with God. And the relationship is primarily expressed in this way of fathers to children. That God is our Father, our loving Father, the one who, who gives us life and brings us into this world and sustains us, and we are His children. So don't speak of God primarily in terms of like a legal relationship or something like that. We're not, uh, that's a way of speaking with, about God. But we speak of him primarily in relationship terms. And you can see that John, right off the bat, wants to talk about what happens when we believe in God. We become children of God. All right? So we are cherished sons and daughters 
of the living God, and this is our identity uh, as Christian people. All right, super important, super foundational to have that concept of what we are in relationship to God, beloved and cherished sons and daughters. We talked a minute ago about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Think about the parable of the prodigal son, right? So the son goes off and spends all the money on whores and all that, and then he comes back, and what happens? The father embraces him and loves him and welcomes him home and throws a big party for him. So when we think of our relationship with God, if we can think of God as a loving father and we are his beloved children, it really, really, really helps to lay an important foundation for our relationship with God. The last thing I want to say, and then it's time to go, is to talk a little bit about this uh, week's memory verse. Every week we're talking about a memory verse. It's some important point of doctrine, some important point that John wants to kind of get across, and we're highlighting memory verses uh, as we go through this study. Why are we doing that? Well, the Bible is a really helpful tool in the spiritual life. Learning the language of the Bible is very helpful to us, and so we're trying to have a few memory verses along the way here uh, so that it's part of the Christian's uh, toolbox that's going to help as we try to uh, go through the spiritual life. So this is our memory verse, and the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. And in this verse, John is uh, teaching us about the doctrine of the Incarnation, what we celebrate every year on December 25th, Christmas, all right? We celebrate the embodiment of God the Son in human flesh as Jesus Christ. There's a lot of different ways to understand the incarnation, and it's a difficult concept that the eternal, all-powerful, uh, all-encompassing God becomes this little baby in the womb of his mother, Mary, and then is born on Christmas Day. All right, This is a difficult theological concept, and yet it's right at the core of everything we do. Uh, that God becomes one of us in the person of Jesus Christ. One of the ways that we've understood it uh, is that God writes himself into the story. So you think about uh, an author writing a book, and he's writing, he's writing, he's writing, and then he writes himself into the book. All right, That's one way to understand uh, this, this verse, that God wants uh, to put himself into the story, and so he does uh, in the person of Jesus Christ. St. Athanasius, he's one of the early church fathers, and he talks a lot about the incarnation. Uh, and he says, here's what happened in the incarnation. The Son of God became man so that men could become God. What he means by that is that because God takes flesh, he becomes a human being, he becomes part of the material world. God is spirit. God doesn't have a body. He's not male or female. He's, he's pure spirit. And then in, on Christmas Day, he's born into a world of material things. He takes on matter. He takes on flesh. And what we say is when he does this, what he does is he begins to redeem all of the material world. An example of this is humanity. All right, this is our last point, and then we're going to be done. All right, because I know everybody's looking forward to being done. It's okay. Think about a painting, all right? And Athanasius talks about the work of Christ, and he says, you know, human beings are these beautiful creations, and yet uh, we know that through sin, they have all kinds of faults and all kinds of shortcomings and all of that. So he says, humanity is like this beautiful painting. An artist paints it. It's beautiful. And then sin is like somebody throwing a bucket of mud on a beautiful painting. And then it doesn't look beautiful anymore. It looks messed up. And then Athanasius says, when God becomes one of us, 
what he sets about doing is he sets about cleaning that painting. He cleans the mud off the painting so that that which was beautiful underneath it is restored. All right? So it's beautiful when God made it in Genesis chapter 1. And then the fall happens and it becomes really ugly. There's some mud thrown on it. And then in John chapter 1, when the word becomes flesh, Jesus goes about cleaning this pain. All right? Is everybody following this concept of the work of Christ? So when the word becomes flesh and dwelt among us, God himself comes to us to restore creation. So there's this theme over and over again of, of creation and recreation. In John's Gospel. So as you're reading it, think of Jesus coming and recreating, redeeming, making beautiful that which was messed up. Alright? So last thing I want to say, the incarnation, we could talk a lot more about it, uh, but obviously we don't have time. There's a whole new lesson that's ahead of us. I want to say two things real quick before we go into that. The first one is that just after this class, so we're going to pray, have a prayer here in just a second, there is a session in the first room on the left, which is the red room, about navigating the Bible. So if you're finding yourself going, I have no idea what any of this Bible, these Bible books mean or where they are, you might want to check that out. Uh, or if you'd like a little more help in learning kind of the, the layout of the Bible. And the second thing I was going to say, I can't remember. Nobody else can remember either, I guess. <laughs> You're going to grab a lesson, uh, and then we'll be back here. The same routine this week. There's homework, there's a, a readings, there's references to other parts of the Bible, and then there'll be a discussion group next Wednesday night. I can't remember what I was going to say, so let's stand and uh, let's pray for you.